Hey all, it's Nero once again from the Overtracker. Today I'm here with the Gigabyte X870E Aorus Elite Wi-Fi 7, a board that was until recently the most cost-effective and most feature-rich AM5 board in SA Part 9. Price has since gone up to 7,500 Rand at Woodwear or 320 US dollars at Amazon. Can't speak for the US, but here in South Africa, this board has been as low as 5999, which is just ridiculous value for what you get. Still, at 7500 it's still the best value for money x870e board you can buy locally period yes there are more feature rich vanilla x870 boards from competitors but at this price there is no x870e equivalent closest to this board is the msi mag x870 tomahawk and the rog strix x870a gaming both of which cost more than the aorus elite wi-fi 7. that being said if one had to at a high level at least compare these three you'd see that the Aorus Elite board is a healthy balance between these two. I mean, just compare the rear IOs, for instance. You can clearly see that the X870E Aorus Elite's rear IO is somewhere in the middle of these two boards. That said, this board uses a six-layer mid-loss PCB featuring a 16 plus 2 plus 2 parallel VRM system, which should be using 60 amp power stages. So clearly, this is a cost-effective design. However, that doesn't mean it's not a capable board. As is, it should be able to handle a 600 watt power draw or higher from the CPUs that work on AM5 platforms. For storage, we have four M.2 sockets, three are wired to the CPU, while just one is wired to the chipset. So you can run up to three Gen 5 M.2 drives, but do keep in mind that if you do that, your GPU will operate at just eight PCIe lanes. Lastly, you get three full lens PCIe slots. One is X16 Gen 5 and two are X4 Gen 3 and Gen 4 respectively. As for the DIY options, we have power, reset button, along with a postcode display. The reset button can, of course, be assigned to save boot or retry. Moving on to the rear I.O., you'll find the Q-Flash button, four USB 2.0 ports, HDMI, and four 5 gigabit USB ports. Finally, we have two USB 10 gigabit ports, two USB 4 Type-C ports, Wi-Fi 7, and Bluetooth 5.4 connectors. Personally, I think Gigabyte is being too generous with the USB 2. I'd happily see all four of these replaced with just one 10 gigabit USB port. And visually, Gigabyte has upped their game of late, and this is yet another board that looks fantastic at this price point. There's nothing about it outside of the rare I.O. that suggests it's a cost-effective solution. The black and gray color scheme works exceptionally well, and it does give off a sense of a more premium board than it actually is. Now let's talk about the actual board, starting with the BIOS. Again, Gigabyte has come a long way with the BIOS, and as is, it's the best it's ever been. The mouse is butter smooth, and I like that I can pick between three themes, white, grayscale, and the default Aorus color scheme. Talking further about the BIOS, it would be nice if Gigabyte showed you the current voltage readings in the options you're planning on changing. For some reason, this has been for years on end as well, Gigabyte just shows you the reference voltage if you see anything at all. The better designed and executed the hardware becomes, the more glaring the disparity between the software side or the UX side and the hardware itself. Talking about the BIOS further or the UEFI, Gigabyte of course claims DDR5 8200 capabilities on the board. However, there are no profiles like they have on say the Z890 equivalent of this board. So you just have to rely on the QVL which indeed does say DDR5 8200 is supported for 8000 and 9000 series Ryzen CPUs. I could post DDR5 8200 myself but of course I couldn't get any semblance of stability going. But that could also be because of my use of memory that's not on the QVL at all, let alone at these speeds. Still, I have no doubt that this board is 8200 capable just based on this alone. Finally, let's talk about performance. Before we get to that, however, testing was done on the AMD Ryzen 5 9600X, the G-Skill Trident Z5 Royal Neo Edition, ROG Strix GeForce RTX 4080, and of course, all of it powered by the XPG Fusion 1600 watt ATX 3.0 PSU. First up, we have IDA64 memory bandwidth. As you can see, there's not much difference between DDR5 5600CL26 and DDR5 with PBO set to plus 200 and a curve offset set to minus 25. Keep in mind as well that the infinity fabric for the PBO result is set to 2133 MHz. Where latency is concerned, we go from 72 nanoseconds to 68. Not much, but every little bit helps, especially for gaming. Where CPU package power is concerned, we can see that unlocking the limits of the board leads to substantial power draw increases. 
However, we're talking about going from 82 watts in games to 104 watts. A 21% increase in power draw, yes, but it's just 22 watts more, so this should not be a concern of any kind. Gaming temperatures also stay more than adequate as you can see. When increasing the SOC voltage, using PBO and all other tuning options, we can see a rise of just 8 degrees to just 63 degrees Celsius. As this isn't a CPU for highly threaded tasks, I only did one multi-threaded test and that's Cinebench 2024. As you can see, PBO and DRAM OC only yields a 4% increase in performance. Not bad, but hardly worthwhile. Not surprising though, as this isn't the ideal CPU for such workloads. We then turn to the gaming benchmarks and start with Hitman World of Assassination. PBO here allows the 9600X to pip the mighty Ryzen 9 7950X not by increasing the minimum frame rate so much, but the average by 4.4%, which is in line with what you saw with Cinebench. In Forza Horizon 5, using the Extreme preset and 720p, the 1% lows go from 154 FPS to 164 FPS. You'll not notice this in gaming, but there is some scaling at least. Cyberpunk 2077, for some reason, gains the most from the overclock, at around 10 FPS for both 1% lows and the average frame rate. Still, the 7950X seems to put in better 1% lows consistently, even though the average is much lower. In Dying Light 2, we can see the Ryzen 5 9600X on the Aorus board starts off below the reference Ryzen 9 7950X, then proceeds to best it with some PBO action and some good memory overdropping. Black Mist Wukong, using the UE5 engine, notorious for not being able to take advantage of multiple cores, shows hardly any gain or difference between these two CPUs or settings. Finally, we have Red Dead Redemption 2, where we can see a gain in the 1% lows, but not much in terms of the average frame rates. So there you have it, the performance figures off the board or CPU if you prefer. Some performance is to be had from overclocking, but it isn't much, at least not much when using this particular CPU and GPU combination. Overall, this is a great value for money board, punching well above its grade and delivering a solid experience for the AM5 CPUs. As is, there are obvious improvements that can be made, but it's delivering more than its competitors, at least on paper. I'll hopefully be evaluating the Ryzen 7 9800X3D on this board when it's launched, but if not, I think it will be a great fit for the CPU because of its price. It could be the most cost-effective way to drive what is sure to be the fastest gaming CPU money can buy right now. Until the next time then good people, I've been Neo and this has been the Gigabyte X870E Aorus Elite Wi-Fi 7. Remember to share, like and subscribe and until the next time, take great care of yourselves guys and I'll see you on the flip side. Peace!